has this ever been you? Did you look at a spec and you're just like scrolling, ah. and scrolling, <laughs> and scrolling, and it never ends? And sometimes code doesn't even load because there's too many, too much stuff. And you're just, when you look at this, you're just like, oh. <laughs> I think we've all tried this. Um, this is what you need. You need automated testing. Because contrary to when, what people think when they hear about testing, like the reason you should do testing is because when you've done it, you have the tests as the byproduct. Um, like, yeah, sure, that's a nice benefit. But I actually think that the main benefit of why testing is useful is because it gives you a sort of process that allows you to break a ginormous spec down into individual pieces and stay focused while you're working and know that you're always making progress towards the larger goal. And then the, the side effect is that when you're done with that whole process, you have tests left over that you can keep running to make sure that you don't break stuff. This is why I think testing is good. Um, and the process is very simple. You write a test before you write any real code. And because of that, it, it fails, it, it has to fail. Then you write some code to make the test pass, and then you go back to the start. And you just repeat that loop over and over. And when you have no more tests left to write, then you're done. Can I just ask, how can we ask questions? And is there a Q&A, or should we ask them as we go? Or You can just ask questions whenever. Um, okay. Testing is sort of a, a very large topic, and I'm, I'm not going to cover everything that, are, that there is to say about testing. That would be dozens of talks. Um, Looking forward to it. <laughs> so if you have any specific questions, just, just shoot whenever. Um, there will be Q&A sections spread out throughout the talk, but just shoot whenever. Um, there's a lot of sort of religion in testing. And there's this like, I don't know why, but, but people who are like fanatic about TDD have this idea that only real developers do mm -hmm. test-driven development and like write tests, which is of course total bullshit. Like testing is just, writing code that makes sure that your code works. It's, it's not that complicated. There is some process around it and how you can sort of optimize it to get the most out of it. But, but testing is sort of inherently simple in that sense. So it's important that if you're sort of getting started with testing and maybe you read a book or two about it, that you don't get sucked into the fanatics and the methodologies because there are testing fanatics. And that is not a place you want to be. Uncle Bob. Huh? Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob, Bob yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say anything stupid, guy. <laughs> like, ha have, have you ever like accidentally made a testing framework? Like, it's two lines. If not, throw. That's a testing framework. So it doesn't have to be more complicated than this. Sure, if, if you're, this is all you need on a web app. If you if you're on a mobile app and you need to manage to simulate and do all that, it's a bit more complicated. But inherently, this is what a testing framework is, right? So it's it's not that hard. Um, just a bit about my background in testing to sort of frame the conversation. Um, I've worked mostly with testing uh, backend web application written in a dynamic language. And that sort of gives some niceties to testing. Just testing an app that takes an HTTP request and generates some JSON. That's just sort of inherently easy because it's stateless. There's no, there's no UI, anything. It's all code. Um, so I cannot say a whole lot about how you would test a mobile app because I've never done it. Um, I also don't have a lot of experience testing in uh, static, statically typed languages. Um, so like the, the sort of balance between what tests would you write in Python and Ruby, but you wouldn't write in Scala or Rust. I don't know a whole lot about that. I also don't know if there's any tests that you would write in Scala, but not in Ruby. I don't know if, if that exists. Um, all right. So tester and development. Let's, let's uh, jump the gun here. I'll refer to this as TDD from now on, just so we're all clear. Um, that is the process that I described before. If you write a failing test, it has to fail. Um, if it passes and you expected it to fail, you have to figure out why, <laughs> that, that sometimes happens. Uh, then you write some code to make that test pass and then you repeat. That's basically what test driven development is. Let's, let's, say, let's say you're uh, building a component, right? I assume that first you at least uh, define what sort of uh, uh, functions that component has, right? So you can directly call them within the test and make them fail, otherwise you have a blank test, right? Uh, you mean like some UI component? Let's say you're thing. writing a parser, uh -huh. and you have a component that is called parser, and there is two methods, parse and copy, right? So I assume that you first write them with an empty body, so no. you can act? No. no, 
No, so I would, I would, I would just write a test that says I have this data. I call some function. I just make up the name parser dot parse given the data, and I get back some output. And then I make assertions on what I want the output to be. Okay, but so I'm just programming by wishful thinking. I'm making it all up. But you still have the, those methods implemented, so so your test compiles. No, 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 it doesn't even compile. Oh. Then, then I run the test and it says, well, in this case, it wouldn't even compile, saying the parser class okay, is not okay. defined. Then I make the parser class okay. and I run it again. It says the parse method is not defined. Then I make the parse <laughs> method. So, um, and is this strict or this is just something that you do? This that's the TDD process. Okay. The the whole idea is that your workflow is driven by the tests. You only write code that the tests tell you to write. And I'll get back to why that's nice. But doesn't um, that lead to a lot of context shift if you like go back and forth? Between no, okay. no. It happens like very fast. You you don't like. I put on my testing hat. I'm writing test. I take off my testing hat. I write code. It, it's all fluid. It's all the same. Um, and and if it is not, that's a problem. It's actually interesting the point you bring up because it, it originates from like I think Ruby actually the TDD movement, and there you actually just run a test that. It throws an exception because the code doesn't exist yet, or the method doesn't exist. Yeah, so, so you, you wouldn't actually get to run the test because they wouldn't even compile. Yeah, in a static language. In a static language. still a test failure. Yeah. yeah. But maybe in a static language it would make sense to have an empty implementation to start with. No. Hmm. Okay. Um, we'll we'll get back fanatic. to We'll get back <laughs> to that. <laughs> 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 um, so this is what sort of a, a, a process, a TDD sort of loop might look like. So you might start with like a high level integration test that assumes that your component or whatever is actually there. Then you'll run that. Then you'll maybe make the, the, the class. Then you'll make the method. Then you'll just return some dummy data. And suddenly you're at a point where the integration test says, I expected this data, but I got this data. Like I wanted this JSON, but I didn't get it. That doesn't tell you where to go. And the whole point of TDD is that you're always driven by the tests. Um, so at that point, you sort of drop down a level and say, okay, now I will not run my integration test anymore, but I'll make a unit test that will give me more fine-grained feedback. So the point is that you're always looking to write like the most sort of focused test that will give you the best guidance to what code to write next. So the tests are telling you what code to write. And if the error is bad, you should think about why that is. And maybe you need to drop down to the unit test level or back up to the integration test level. And then you basically repeat that cycle until all your unit tests are done. And you go back up, run the integration test, maybe you go back and forth a few times, eventually your integration test passes and then you're done. And the key here is that at each step you write as little code as possible. You don't say, I have my integration test and I can kind of just monkey code the whole thing. But if, if the integration test didn't tell you to do that, you're not allowed to do that. Um, so this is what, what people who in TDD, they say there's the inner and the outer loop. So the outer loop is this integration cycle where you write a high level test and then that's the inner loop in the middle where you get very fast feedback from your tests and this is what we call the red green refactor cycle so red is when you've written a test that doesn't pass it's red when you make it pass it's green then optionally you refactor your code if necessary and you sort of repeat this inner loop go back out to the outer loop back in in and out until you're done and this is the sort of repeatable process that allows you to break a large problem down and this is what i think is the main benefit of doing testing because you never sort of lose sight of where you have to go because the test always tells you what to do. And that is also why if you go ahead and start writing code that a test didn't tell you to write, then you lose that sort of feedback cycle. And then you run the risk of just building the whole thing accidentally without having a test actually tell you to do it. And then your coverage is not good and it might hurt your design. Like you might accidentally make something that's hard to test because it wasn't driven by the tests. And I agree, it is fanatic. Uh, in, in some cases, it's always sort of a, a, a judgment call of what makes the most sense. Um, but I have experienced, especially in a dynamic language, that it works really well. Yes. Um, how to phrase it? Uh, so, so, okay, so, so if you're developing by strictly driving the tests that dictate you how to build a component, right? What happens if and, and, and you have some sort of an idea of what you want this component to do, right? And you went through the entire process from not having any code, right? And writing a test that you uh, uh, have a, you wish that this is how this component looks like, and you run through the entire process, then the test passes, and then you realize that it makes no sense. 
like that the component actually doesn't really do things that you would want it to do in a certain way. Is that because the component is not complete or because I wrote the wrong test? Mm. Mm, no, so, so I'm thinking about, um, yeah, maybe. That would suggest the test is wrong then, actually. Because I, I would imagine that in this scenario, you have sort of a, like a design or a spec of what, what the user is able to do with the component. I'm, and I'm, that you're able to test. Yeah. I would um, never just like make, make stuff up. Like. The, the way I'm thinking about it is, and maybe it makes no sense in backend. I've never coded backend, so I don't know. But maybe it makes sense in our case a little bit. Let's say we have context objects, right? And, and some environment that uh, stuff lives in. Mm -hmm. And you, you create a test with an assumption of how the component looks like and what it should do. And you finish it up, and then it turns out that in reality, it's not really usable in the environment where you would want it to use. Does it make sense? Then, then you started with a test that was yeah, too low level. Exactly. Okay. Then, you, then, then you made an assumption about what the interface was going to be, and you wrote the low level piece first. When you should have written the high level integration piece first, so that you have the boundaries nailed down. And then when you know that those line up, then you can implement the sort of fine grained functionality. Does that make sense? It the thing is, the thing is in CDD, you have the, the test, as you say, the test defines your implementation. So if the implementation is wrong, that means the test was wrong. Your mm -hmm. testing is also assuming that you have 100% coverage, right? That the test was just wrong. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, but like now you're saying that you're assuming a well defined spec. Uh, isn't that like a quite a strict requirement? For testing and development, like that, you you actually the, the spec has to be right to begin with, uh, because if you then have to like if there comes changes to the spec afterwards, then you have twice as much code that you need to like refactor. But if so, if if you didn't have any tests and the spec changes, which it always does, how would you know that you're implementing the changes correctly? Then you don't have the tests anymore to sort of lean against to know that everything still works. Well, then well, you're the just test has to be changed as well, right? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. But I think that's a good thing. Yes. Then exactly. you just change the test and then you can pinpoint yeah. exactly why. It's a really a mindset thing. The test is the spec. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But who tests the test? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't have tests for the tests, which is unfortunate. It's the only code that's never tested. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, there is a, a concept in, in TD called a spike which is when you have no clue where to even begin. You don't write tests, you just cowboy code some code just to figure out, can I even get these pieces to talk together? When that is done and you know what to do, you delete the code and then you TDD it. That's called a spike. Yes. Are you gonna touch more upon the scope of unit versus integration tests? Um, so we've already covered some of this, um, but what you get from doing this is you get the, the less overwhelmed feeling because you always have the test to sort of lean against. And have you, have you ever like had a whole day where you were just in the trenches coding all day and at the end of the day you're not really sure if you made progress towards the goal? I've had many of those days, but at least you can sort of look at all the integration tests that you made pass during the day. And the integration test should sort of be the most highest level. So that's sort of what the user would do or the user of your API or whatever. So at least there you can see that you're actually making progress. Um, and you also get that like nice sort of minute to minute feedback where you never just like code for two hours, but you never actually see if any of, of the stuff you're writing actually works. Um, and I, I've also found that starting from, from the outside leads to less mistakes down the road. If you sort of make assumptions about how everything's going to be wired up in the end, which if you build all the individual pieces and then you have to plug them together, sometimes it just doesn't work. Like you thought that these two were the types, but they're actually not and I can't convert between them. I have to rewrite part of my code. By starting from the outside, you avoid at least some of that. Um, and the, the, night, the nice sort of side effect is that you basically get 100% coverage for free. Because any code that you wrote was written because there was a failing test. You never write like 200 lines of code and like six conditions when you would have one test. Then you would have six tests that told you to write each of these conditions. Uh, so that's, what, that's a nice side effect. And I guess also in terms of getting good test coverage, if you did the opposite, where you do it, do the implementation first and then the test, I imagine that it's actually harder to come up somehow to come up with a test, a one hundred percent test coverage on the thing you build. Like yes. that is a given in CDD. Yes, it 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 is. Yeah, yeah. It is not because like, I would I would assume that you at least have like ninety percent plus yeah, coverage, yeah, yeah. but you should yeah. not like 
But you will definitely have more than ten. <laughs> if you're if you don't have if you only have ten percent coverage, you're not doing TV. Like, yeah, that's no, no, of course. Uh, and like sometimes Coke is refactored and move around, so you you cannot maintain hundred percent coverage. And chasing that hundred percent number is is not beneficial. As long as it's in the nineties or hundred range, chasing you're, the window. you're good. Um, yes, coverage is a very like difficult. Uh, metric because it's usually line based, mm. which doesn't mean that even no, if a line is covered, it's not weighted. It's yeah. tested. Like all possible inputs, uh, like for an integer, for example, you're not testing. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. that would be a lot of tests. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a bit like what Yoda says do or do not, there's no try. You can't do TDD half. You have to commit to the write the test first, write the minimal code, and base your implementation on the test. Otherwise, you're not going to get all these nice benefits. <coughs> and it, it, it is an investment to make. We do have to make new habits. You're basically taking the entire development process and sort of flipping it upside down, which is a shocker to some people who've never done it before. And it is very weird. Um, and it also means that like you're going to be running tests all the time. In some of the early days in Tunzer, I wrote a little program that would like measure how many times I ran tests a day, and which file it was, and what the output was, and I made like a nice spreadsheet and pie charts and everything, uh, and I ran tests like 600 times a day, which is pretty crazy. That was also in a dynamic program, language. Yeah. Hmm? Did you test that program? <laughs> no, that was just cow. Uh, I could have, and I probably should have. Um, <laughs> But that was also in a, in a dynamic language, so the test was almost my compiler in a sense. So like in Rust or Scala, I wouldn't write that many tests because the compiler would yell at me all the time. Um, so some of the sort of things that I've spent a long time building in, into my sort of editor setup is that like I can hit uh, Command T to just run a test, and if I'm in a non-test file and hit Command T again, it just reruns the previous test. So I can like find a test, mark it as the current one, and then keep running that while I'm in other files. Uh, I also have Command K. I only have it set up for Ruby, where it'll run the test on the current line, which is really nice when you have a long test suite. Uh, I'm not sure if you can do that in Scala. You can't easily do it in Rust, which is sort of unfortunate. Um, you're also going to want an easy way to like switch from the implementation code to the test code. Uh, and like the command that I've set up will also automatically create the test file if it's not there. So switching to the test code is the same as creating the test file, basically. Yes. So I've always like found that difficult because do you have, uh, so I have this file, and that file has exactly one test file. Does that mean that my unit test and integration test for that thing module is No, in it only file? works for unit tests when you have a specific file for, yeah. for a given. It doesn't work for like, if you have like, in Rails you don't have a, like a, a, a file for one route. That would typically be a, a control and then several service mm -hmm. classes. Uh, but then I just have a, a, a test in spec integration, whatever. And then you just have to search for them. Any questions so far? I think there's been lots of questions throughout. Yes? So this is coming from a, a static language background, uh, because I've done kind of TDD at Sunless before in Ruby, um, where moving to Scala, which I also did there, you start doing uh, TDD meaning type-driven, uh, where you like write out types and stuff, and make the compiler basically give you that loop initially. So your, your loop is now building out the whole, like, the type signature of everything. Interfaces. Interfaces. Uh, and meanwhile, you can still start adding implementations, of course, writing a test first. Uh, but types are uh, like not used anymore. It's not like you just drop all that uh, feedback. You kind of have to mix it for yes. to make it work. And Unfortunately, I don't have five years of experience oh, doing right, that. Right. But I think the, the important part is that, that still gives you the feedback and the sort of process that where you're working. You don't, you don't just give that up because you don't you don't write a hundred tests, you just write 10 tests. I like to think of the feedback that we get from metals as running tests. Exactly. Uh, aren't you? Some kind of tests. Yep. Um, I just briefly want to touch upon the different kinds of tests. So much bullshit here. Like if you just Google like the different kinds of tests, you'll find like some Java developer who wrote a blog post with like twenty different kinds of tests, like <laughs> system tests, functional acceptance, smoke. I don't, I don't even know what a sanity <laughs> test is. It sounds like something you should go to a psychiatrist to to have performed. I have no idea what this even means. And many of the people who write these books, they say that this is the de definition, this is what it is until the end of time. Someone else writes a different book with a different definition, and then the words are just totally useless. So don't don't 
don't get bogged down in, into what all these words mean. I like to use two words, integration and unit. Uh, an integration test is sort of a, a breadth first test. So you cover a lot of ground, but you don't go into detail about like fine grained behavior. Usually you just sort of test one pass through the flow if everything goes according to plan, so like the happy path. And perhaps one sad path just to make sure that your error handling is wired up correctly. But you don't test if you're doing like phone number validation or, or, or onboarding. You don't test each thing that could possibly go wrong in your onboarding because the test would just be too slow. Um, and the, the, the focus of this, this comes mostly from, from a, a dynamic language where the purpose is mostly to ensure that all the parts are wired together correctly. You get a lot of that for free in static languages, not 100%. Um, there's like in, in Sangria, you can ask for arguments that you might not have told Sangria that you want to use, for example. Stuff like that. So you still need some test coverage. Um, yeah, but, but that's, <coughs> yeah. no, go ahead. that's interesting because you, you're saying to only test the happy path, right? And then... No, in the integration test. Yeah, to test a happy path. Uh, to see if the components align together and they, they connect uh, as they are supposed to, right? And then maybe as an error handling uh, uh, case, right, uh, if that's for the sub path, right? But what if there is uh, 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 plenty of different ways this can go? Um, like, how? what if there is several different paths and you're testing that your happy path works and then you're actually testing that your defined sub path does not work so it's all cool, but then in reality, other set paths they actually do work. So that that's, that's what comes next, no, right? Th this this is what I said in the beginning, where you should not get too bogged down into the specifics of the process. If you feel that six integration tests gives you value in this case because there just are lots of paths through the code, then that's cool to write. Like there's no one whipping you from behind saying you can only have one integration test. That that's totally fine. The, the purpose is just, you should focus on writing the test that will bring you the most value. Uh, and you're also referring to what comes after what David calls integration test, where you actually go down and figure out all the paths. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's the next level after integration test in this concept. Okay. I think, if I understand. But I think also that integration test is like the most valuable in the package, where there are like very, very much clear defined paths. And where the, the errors like, uh, should be more well known, like But in the mobile app, this would be like the user going through and clicking in the UI. Exactly. That, that would be an because integration right test in my mind. We have one UI test in the iOS app, and that is the happy path of the onboarding. Yes. And that's kind of what I feel like this is. Yes, I would definitely call that an integration yeah. test. Yeah. Yes. So if you write this first, then I assume that you can only test that the let's say it's a, a top level function, uh, that it produces a successful output, but you don't actually test on the output because that would imply having... No, I, 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 sure I would do that, I would do that. But um, doesn't that imply that everything underneath is working as it should? Yes, that, that's kind of what you want. You so want your top level integration yeah, test okay, failing. So that's gonna fail yes. until you've done all the unit stuff. Together. And then hopefully you'll have that mm -hmm. only part of your unit test will fail. And then you're able to sort of pinpoint which yeah. path is wrong. Um, yeah, you're just sort of using the integration test as this like North Star. Like yeah, when this test important. passes, yeah. the feature works. Yeah, okay. And days. it might it might take days ah, yeah, to get yeah. this to work. So you just start defining this top level, but then you actually go to work with the low level yeah. stuff. Yes, this and is the, the, the outer and yeah, inner yeah, loop. Yeah, yeah. So the outer loop can be That's very long, several days. You just like in the inner loop all the time and eventually the whole feature right, passes. Feature. Yes. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Um, but, but I think um, it makes a lot of sense, but I think that I am misunderstanding what an integration test is. Uh, what you're talking about, in my mind, is called, or at least in the mobile world, world, is called a UI test. The integration test, as I understood it, was uh, the, the test that tests whether or not different components actually connect with one another. <coughs> Say, uh, uh, local database and some uh, uh, server requests and lower level components. If you have a, let's say, user session database, and etc you run some sort of a function and you check whether or not, you know, at the end of the day, 
stuff is going to be cached, let's say, in a database, but there are not, this is, integra and this is at least how I understood That's also how I understood it, but I think it also goes back to your point about there are many names for many tests, and they mean different things in different contexts. In this context, integration test means this, and in our, it means something else. Yeah. I think the point here is the approach to it. Yes. Starting with the top level one and then working your way down to the low level things. Yeah. Then maybe we should just forget the words for our own sentence. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is the, the, the line between an integration test and use test is also very fuzzy. There are some hardcore GD fanatics who would argue that if you talk to the database in a test, it is by definition not a unit test because you have a dependency on the database. In my mind, in my experience, that doesn't matter. You can talk to the database just fine. Mm -hmm. And in fact, marking out the entire database would mean that you have to sort of build all this setup just to make your test true unit tests. <laughs> but like, in my experience, that's, that's fine. Talking to the database yeah, okay, is fine. Then, then that's the difference. Because uh, at least uh, uh, on the Android side of things, the moment you mock anything, this is not a unit test anymore. Hmm. What? Because if you mock stuff, you cannot run it on the JVM. You have to run it on the emulator. And that, by definition, in our case, is not a unit test. Also, if you mark a view model state. Um, no. Not okay. Really. Okay. Wait. When you mock something, you yeah. have to run it. Yes. Emulator? Yes. How is that? Sounds like Android weirdness. But Java has unit tests. Yeah. You can do both. Uh, yeah. It's 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 uh, it's to do with the Android system having some components uh, directly specified by the mobile device. So if you want to use some of the functions that you have on the Android uh, platform, you have to have the information about the device. Let's say you yeah, want yeah, to use one of the cell phone context, right? Right, right. right. That, sure. that has, yeah, it has been in some ways. But yeah. what's confusing to me, I'm not questioning yeah. it at all, it's just if you mark it out, you're by definition yeah, implementing it yourself. Yeah, right? exactly. For so we would call it an implementation test. But so if you mark it out, you have to run it on the emulator, not if you don't mark it out. Yes. That does I don't understand. I don't think I don't think it's I all, all my questions. Questions. But I think for the, the the specifics for the Android device, uh, like the context and everything is driven by that, then we have to have it in the Anyway, I think yeah. this is about the approach. Yes. Yes. Uh, so a val very valid question is why not just have integration <coughs> tests? And you can do that. You can totally build a product with only integration tests. But what you will run into is CI builds that look like this, that take an Whoa. hour to run. And if you have to wait like an hour before you can push a fix, that's not fast feedback at all. You will also run into a scenario where your test suite is very binary. Either the whole thing fails or the whole thing passes because everything is wired together. And if you touch one thing, you have to change everything else. So this is sort of more what, what you would want, where there's a high level test that fails and then there's some more fine grained unit tests that tell you exactly what's wrong. So then we come to the unit tests, which we've already kind of covered. These are the sort of depth first tests where you focus on covering all the possible cases, but not necessarily the integration between all the pieces, just that this specific case is handled and produces the correct error, for example. Um, and it, it in a unit test, you typically want as few dependencies as possible because the more dependencies you have, the more you're sort of integrating things and the slower your test is, and the more reasons your test have to change and fail, and it'll just become kind of flaky. You should, you should try to have your unit test depend on as few things as possible. It shouldn't just be one thing because then you're in fanatic world and you have to mark the database, which might not be sort of safe to do. Uh, and it's also important that unit tests are very fast. If, unit, if a single test takes more than, a th than 100 milliseconds, probably not a unit test anymore. Like if you have a test suite with 5,000 tests that each take 100 milliseconds, that can very quickly become a large test suite. Um, so there's this concept called the testing pyramid, which is that you want the top 10-ish percent of your test suite to be integration tests, and the rest, 90% is covered by unit tests. Because if, if it's the other way around, your test suite would be too slow and not actually give you good feedback when stuff is broken. Uh, and that 10% is of course a, a fuzzy number. It's just sort of a way to say that most of your tests should be fast unit tests. All right, I've actually prepared a live coding demo. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Is that a font? No, that's the default font of this of this theme, just italics. <coughs> um, so, Anas. Anas has been talking a lot about event sourcing as a thing that he thinks is interesting. I've never 
used it or tried it myself before, so I'm sort of working on this research project, which is basically a Twitter clone uh, using event sourcing. So it's built in Rust and with GraphQL, of course, because are there other ways to build stuff? Um, <laughs> so this is just what the schema looks like. Um, you can create a user, you can log in. I store the passwords in clear text, so don't use this for anything real. It's a research about event sourcing, not crypto, so whatever. Uh, you can post tweets and you can like load a tweet with an ID and get yourself and stuff like that. Fairly common stuff. So the, the case that I'm not handling is the case where your tweet is too long. So you post a tweet that's over, say, 140, let's use the old limit, and that should be rejected by the system. Can you quickly give an introduction to event sourcing? The idea is that instead of, um, instead of just when you make a mutation, instead of just updating your state in the database directly, you save an event. So you have sort of an audit log of everything that has happened in your system, and that is the state. So if you want to compute the state of the world, you can basically do a fold from the beginning of your stream until the very end, and then you will sort of know what your state is. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the core. Um, basically the transaction log of the database, but you redefine this code. Yes. I, I actually do have a normal Postgres database with tables in it that I just update each time I get an event. I apply that event to, to my tables. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when I have 10 million events, I would have to compute the state but from the beginning. But you also store the, the events, right? Yes, I also so store the events, yes. So in, uh, in event sourcing, what he's doing there is a projection mm -hmm. that he's storing, like a snapshot of like the fully rolled up state. So if he lost all that data but still had the events, he could roll up all the events and fold them together mm -hmm. into one big state that you could store all the events. Yeah. And this is super useful for machine learning because you, you never lose data. And you always know how did, how did you get into this state that I'm in now. You always know. You can always look at the events. That was a big problem that the machine learning team had at Tunser because we didn't have any events. So they, they didn't know anything. Um, all right, step one is to run all the tests just to make sure that they pass. Um, it takes a couple of seconds because Rust has to compile each time. Great. Uh, so let's say that we have a, I have this test web file. Um, here we have a test for, you can just s sign in as a user, create a tweet and load it out. That sounds like a good place to start. Uh, so we basically want to post a tweet that's too big and assume that it didn't get created or we got an error or something. So let's just copy this entire function, paste it, and say cannot post tweet that is too long. Um, we need a long text. Let's just say text. Uh, in Rust, you can say iter repeat. So that'll make an infinite lazy iterator of the character A. You can take... Uh, the first 200 of those and collect into a string. That just gives us a long string. Then we can post that text. We don't actually care about the tweet ID that we got back. And we don't need this response thing either. But we should get back uh, no data. Let's say errors. Oops. My editor updating all the time is very aggressive. It, it checks every time I type. So it tells me that I have syntax errors all the time, but I'm like, I'm not done typing. Wait, it's not a problem in Scala. I guess it's the RLS Rust setup. Um, yeah, probably. Message, uh, tweet is too long. All right, let's run that. So I expect is cargo for that? Yes, that's an alias that I made for cargo. And T is to run the test. All right. Um, so it expected to not get any data back, but it actually got data back. So here it's sort of diffing the, the JSON and telling me exactly what the difference is. Seems familiar. <laughs> um, all right. So I have this file called mutation, where I have the action to post a tweet. So here I get the, the text that they want to write, I make the event, and I insert it into the event stream. And then the event is sort of processed asynchronously. This is, is a thing that I haven't figured out yet, is if applying the event to the aggregate of the projection, but that fails. Mm. Since it happens asynchronously, how do you tell the clients? Mm. I, I haven't solved that yet. So let's just do the validation in here and just reject the event entirely. You might say, in sort of a purest event sourcing sense, that you should record the event, even though it's invalid, because it is a thing that happened. Um, but, uh, but this is not about event sourcing. We're focused on the, on the testing. Uh, 
uh, usually you, you have commands that translates to events, and commands can fail, and they can respond with that, because you do validation. Uh, you need the full rollup of the aggregate you're working on, then you have a new event to try and apply it, uh, and if that fails, your command fails, and you never write that again. So right. the command is basically <coughs> like user commands. Uh, there's a word. Let's talk about it during lunch. Yeah. Uh, let's just imagine that we have a function called validate uh, tweet text that takes the text. And that might return an error. And the way that you sort of propagate errors up in Rust is using the question mark afterwards. Rust doesn't have the concept of exceptions. It just has result, like either values. And you have to manually bubble those up. Uh, so if I was in Ruby, I would now run the test. And it would tell me that this function doesn't actually exist. But the compiler is already telling me that. So this is sort of our red-green refactor loop. So let's just define that. Uh, validate tweet text takes a text. And this just means that it returns maybe a nothing. So like it either returns nothing or an error. Because validating the text doesn't actually produce any valuable data besides the error. Um, so the function does work. If I were to compile now, it says that I don't actually return a result, but I have to. OK, so we're writing minimal code, so I'll just make it pass and run the code again. So I'm not actually doing any validation. So I expect the test to still fail with the same error. All right, so notice that the test is just telling me that it expected to not get any data, but it got data. That isn't really telling me what code to write next. Obviously, in this case, we know what to write next. But the idea is that now we drop down from the outer loop and go into the inner loop and actually think about well, why can a tweet be invalid? So let's make a unit test, which in Rust you just do inline with the test attribute. Um, and then we say, what if we assert that uh, validate tweet text of hello? That's a valid text. That should be OK. Um, and now if I were to run the test again, it'll run both my integration test, which I want to fail. I'm, I'm not ready for that one yet. Um, so this is where in Ruby, I would be like, but, but only run this one test. Question. Yes. Because you just mentioned a second ago that uh, 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 when you run a test, that uh, you still get the same result. It's cool. But the, uh, the test results does not, do not tell you what Code uh, you should write next, right? Yes. So you went and wrote this test. Yes. But that assumes that you know what code to write next. That's, no, that's the test is the code you're writing next. Now yeah. you're trying to write a test that tells you what. Yes. Code to write. It's because you're the right. Yes. Test didn't tell anything, but this test is going to tell. No, you you are correct. I am making an assumption about what code to write next, and I'm making a test that tells me to write that. And, and that is fine, because when I go back to run my integration test, it will ensure that I actually did all my assumptions correctly. Mm -hmm. If my assumption were wrong, the integration test would tell me. Okay. So, But you are right. There is a level yeah, of, of assumption Because there. the way I understood it was that the compiler uh, test doesn't tell me what to do next. So I, but I know what to do next, so I'm just going to verify that uh, I'm saying what to do. Uh, yeah, but I think the, the, I the, the, the difference here is that if you had just only had the first test that you wrote, since you contextually knew that you would have to do a validator, you would just implement the validator without writing the test for that validator yeah. first. And that's the approach you want to say, is that you write the test for the validator yes. for that to dictate you what the implementation of the validator is. Okay. And you have an external spec for validation. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have some code about that actually tells you this. All right, so if you want run just our unit test, um, I, I expect it to pass because I didn't do any actual validation. Mm -hmm. So now we can go back and run the integration test, which we just did, and we know that it fails. So let's say that if we... Question. Yes. Shouldn't that unit test you just made have uh, returned an error to begin with as the first thing instead of mm -hmm. passing? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. That, 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 that's not super important. Um, you can do it both ways. So let's just take this long text that we made before. Uh, that should now be an error. And it is not an error. So we asserted that we got an error back. And that failed, which means we didn't get an error back. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. 
some uh, test evangelists preach only a sort of one thing for a test? How do we feel about that? Mm. Uh, that's a very hard thing to follow because you can hide multiple assertions in, in one assertion. Mm. Like if you have, if you want to make three assertions, you put all the values into a list and assert that the list is the same. That's one assertion, but you're comparing three things. Sure. Um, I, 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 get, I get what they're trying to say. What they're trying to say is make the error message more helpful. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's sort of fussy and you have to sort of learn with experience where the boundary is. In this case, I think it's fine. Um, I think it, especially in integration tests, uh, if you have like a giant setup, uh, I just wrote one yesterday with three assertions in it because there are like three different things I wanted to assert on, uh, like three different people in a referral link. Uh, mm. if, you, if I had to do that three yeah. times, it would take a long time because I'm creating three users yeah. and setting up agreements for them. So set up a marketing time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually like that my assertion, like my sort of integration says read almost like a story. Like the user does this, then this happened, then this, then this, then this, and there you will have many assertions and many steps. It's also um, easy to write that kind of test, sorry. Uh, mm. if, yeah. if, you, if you have the code doc that says, uh, the user mm. does this, this, and this, mm. if you can write a test that looks like that, that's pretty nice. Yes. Mm. But you can, you can still write that, like having a huge setup, and then you can have three tests, which is basically three assertions. It's the same test, though. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you can see, okay, this one thing you passes, give it a better these name. two yeah. things don't pass. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying everything failed, you can see exactly what has failed and what is failed. Then you have like shared state between two tests. But that's where something yeah. like RSpec, which we use on iOS, called Quick and Nimble. What? RSpec. Do you use RSpec, like the Ruby library? That I yeah, but it's a the user library inspired by it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the same idea, but implemented for Swift. Ah, ah. It's just called Quick and Nimble. But, and that allows you to write the story. First, you describe what are we testing. Then you write in string like a human readable sentence. This is the context we're in. Then it should do this and this, and then you do your assertion. And then you can, s after that, to say it should also do this and this, and then make a new context so you have these levels of hierarchy so you can make this user story. And all those sentences that you have, they will generate a long name for a test that is exactly what you're yeah. testing. Mm -hmm. That's super nice, I think. Yeah. So, so some people like it, some people don't. Yeah, Personally, I, I like amazing, it as well. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. I like you can write the same amount of code, but just have your assertions be a test. Yeah. You can that that depends on your test framework. Usually, you in in Ruby, you cannot have you cannot easily have setup outside the test that needs to go inside the test. So if you only want a one assertion, you would have the setup assertion one, another test, same setup assertion again. That's a bit easier in Scala because you just make a future and you can pull the same value out multiple times. You can easily do that in Ruby. Okay. <laughs> I have definitely not done that. Sorry. <laughs> 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 All right. So now we actually we have a text that is valid and one that is invalid. So let's say that if uh, text dot length over 140 uh, return error tweet is too long now I expect the test to pass yes so um, you put 140 in your implementation now your previous test doesn't tell you to put 140 there not exactly no so, yeah. if you put 141 That test passes. Let's run the whole suite. The integration test should pass as well now. And it does. So you might argue that what we're testing in this test is exactly the same that we're testing here. But this one also checks that the error message that I create actually gets propagated through the system correctly. So there is more stuff here. Um, one case that we didn't cover here is what if you make an empty tweet? Is that allowed? Currently it is, but probably should not. Let's say that in our system that is not allowed. Um, so then we can say if is empty. But the fanatic would have run the test now before you pass into the tweet, no? Oh yeah, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I, I I think you I think you should do that. Okay. Because the, the key part in T D D is you have to write a failing test. Right, exactly. If you don't see it fail, exactly. it's not a failing test. Exactly. And you I agree that is a bit fanatic, but you run into the situation where you think you're testing one thing. Yeah. yeah. But actually, your test will just always pass, yes. and then it's not providing you any value. 
So you, you, you ha that's right, you have to see the test fail. Right. That's why you need a, a pair with you as well. <laughs> All right, so it fails for the right reason. Then we bring our code back. Now it should pass. Let's just run our unit test. When I was working at Tunsor, I was fanatic about test speed. Like more than a second to wait before I got output just drove me mad. <laughs> Unfortunately, in compiled languages, you have to wait a bit longer. Um, we also have a quicker like, inner, inner loop. Yes. yes, that's true. And now everything passes. Um, if you go in the implementation, and instead of doing a uh, text with length greater than 140, I put equal, equal 141. That should also pass. Uh, it didn't pass the integration test because we used 200 there as the value. Right, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, there's uh, it, my point being that uh, your implementation might be overly specific to your set of tests. Yes. So you're, only, you're testing, like it's best effort, right? You, you don't yes. know, you, you're not never testing the complete set of input arguments. Mm -hmm. like, so yeah, if you're implementing like a plus function, you can't possibly <laughs> test that on all numbers. No, but you want to test like happy paths and edge cases, right? Then. But yes. it, you define the edge case. Yeah, but in this case, the edge case would be then right below 140 or equal to 140 and above 140. That's the switching point, right? You're yeah. assuming that that would be, yeah. But in a more complex system, that's not oh always yeah. easy. There would also be a name. Yeah, 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 sure, those two things. But that's the, like, that's the two edge cases of that implementation, in my view. So I would test it being in between and at, like, right at the edge and beyond the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But but it, it is still a best effort. You you, yeah, you no, will no, never no. know. Of course, there are things where you cannot put those boundaries and pinpoint them. But do as best as you can. Property testing can help a lot. Uh, I have unfortunately never done that. I would I would like to try it. It's built into C uh, tests. Ah. So now we just tested 140, and that one should not be an error. Yay. So the, the problem is like if you were doing this 600 times a day, even though you just have to wait four seconds, mm. it'll drive you mad. Um. <coughs> so notice that we, we could have taken these four tests and made them as integration tests. But then we would have like we have all this noise here. Like we have a user, we have authentication, all this stuff. All we care about is given this text, is it valid? But you could technically argue that we can delete this test now because it is covered just as well over here, except we don't have the error mm -hmm. propagation stuff. So I would argue that this integration just is still providing value. Yes. Any questions about the? Yes. We're almost there. Good. All right. I just briefly want to mention some topics that I decided not to cover. Um, <laughs> We, sp we spoke on the role of coverage. Uh, that was because of questions. Um, adding tests to, to legacy code. I in my mind, any code that does not have tests is legacy by definition. It doesn't matter if it was written yesterday or 10 years ago, it's, it's legacy code. Um, that's not something that I've had a lot of experience doing. We're sort of doing it slowly at the back end now, not quite rigorously, but I think we should do more of that. Um, there's a book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code, which covers that topic. I've not read it, but people recommend it, so maybe that's a good book to read. Yeah. Um, we haven't talked about stopping and mocking at all. That's a huge topic in the testing world. Um, we haven't talked about how to test third-party dependencies. Like if you have to integrate with QuickPay or some other third-party API, how do you do that? Or if the mobile clients have to talk to the Scala backend, how do you do that? Um, I don't know, because I've never had to do it. <laughs> it's hard. Um, we haven't talked about duplication between tests. Like you just saw me take that integration test where you post a successful tweet, copy the whole thing and change the last half. But the first top is duplicated between each test. Is that okay or not? Mm -hmm. There are some opinions there. Um, and we also haven't discussed the cost of having more code because there is definitely a cost to it. And sometimes you change like the name of a function or the signature of a function and you have to update your implementation code and your test code. And that's what people who don't like testing say. They don't like wasting time on that because there's more code. Personally, not no surprise there. I think that that is 
Like th that that is worth. But at it. some point, you should also spend less time reassuring that your code still works after refactoring, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there is. It should at some point at least try to equal each other. Yeah, but if you like refactor an entire system that have a yeah, thousand yeah, tests, true. that that just sucks. But that's yeah. just something that you have to do because yeah. the test is something that you want to have and they provide your value. These are the same arguments that people use against static type. Exactly. I don't want to update my type. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Any final questions? Otherwise, that's it. Yes. I would like to just uh, point out in, uh, in JavaScript, there's a really nice library called Jest, which is made by Facebook. That really uh, it's really nice with test-driven development, where there's you can run like the standard way of running it is a test watcher. You just run it and then it tests your whole project, and whenever you change a file, it runs those tests that are testing that file to just have it always running in the background. So does that understand that an integration test is hitting that file? Yeah. T typically not. There are similar projects in Ruby, and I have yeah, I've never yeah. used them because. So if you have like a, a big integration test that's written for another uh, module, but it's actually using your new module on the Ruby, does, does, I think it does. Uh, watch you understand that it's like the bigger integration test? Like, like one test is like testing two files. So an integration test will be testing multiple files. Yeah. And it's not the integration test you're working on, but it's impacted by your changes now. I'm pretty sure. In order to look at that, you would have to have a dependency, dependency graph, graph, right? So yeah. it's like in the I mean, they can be in this. Yeah. But like if, if you're in a web app and you, and you call post slash tweet, it's really hard to figure out what code what does that actually call yeah. unless you have types. But I, I mean, that's like, like it's it's just uh, to help you would still no, run right, you yeah. would still run all your yeah. tests in the pipeline and so on. We can actually do that with loop. Mm. We do a watcher for like yes. say I want to run this test and I want to run it in file say. Yes. The the reason that I've not used that is because I, I save all the time. Like every yeah. time I got up insert mode in Vim I save, but I don't want to run the test yet because I'm not ready. Mm. So. Um. Okay. It's great. Woo! Woo! Woo!